Merkel Media. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves. He's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blowed his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling it. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Listening to The Confessionals, I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. That's theconfessionalspodcast at gmail.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the connection section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me, just get a hold of me. Now let's get into the Art Bell iTunes five-star ratings and reviews. This week we have... The Stella Rosa, Lumberzack 88, Dirk Yes, Sunshine 1941, Confused About Bigfoot, and Utero 77. Thank you very much for going to iTunes and leaving the five star rating and review. It definitely helps out the show. And if you do that, we give you a shout out on the following week's show. Now, moving on here to the Patreon shout outs. This is for anybody who goes to patreon.com forward slash the confessionals and signs up to become a patron to help support the show on a monthly basis. And this week's shout outs is Jody B. Adam L, Elian W, Monty W, Carol F, and Daniel H. Thank you very much for going to patreon.com forward slash the confessionals and signing up to become a patron to help support the show. I really do appreciate it. You really do help keep the show alive. Thank you very much. Now, this week we have Bill Sheehan coming on, and Bill Sheehan is the author of the book series Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters. Bill is going to be sharing some of these stories that are in his book on today's show. But before we get to talking to Bill, let's bring on David Halevi from the Jew and Gentile Radio, who has narrated another blog that my wife Lindsay has written. The blog is called A Time Traveling Hero or The Internet's First Hoax. Who is John Teeter? John Teeter is a famous internet character that claims to have been a time traveler. And Lindsay did a whole research on it with the blog and everything like that. So let's get into it right now. A time traveling hero or internet's first hoax? Who is John Teeter? In 1957, the world asked, who is John Galt? That year, objectivism author Ayn Rand published her most famous novel, Atlas Shrugged, and the refrain throughout the story, who is John Galt, wondered at the mysterious identity of a man who may or may not exist. John Galt seemingly appears and disappears from out of thin air, a faceless legend who cannot be traced, but who has the ability to affect the future of a nation. The repeated phrase, who is John Galt, became the universal way of asking a question no one could really answer. In 2000, as the internet was still evolving into a powerful information superhighway, the world asked, who is John Teeter? Also seeming to appear from out of thin air, John Teeter emerged faceless and mysterious on the internet message boards of Coast Coast AM and Art Bell. His message? That he was a time-traveling soldier from 2036, sent back in time to affect the future of a nation, and maybe save the world. The Messages of John Teeter When John Teeter first appeared on the internet message boards, he identified himself as Time Travel O and posted a simple message about his mission and his means of time travel. Quote, Greetings, I am a time traveler from the year 2036. 
I am on my way home after getting an IBM 5100 computer system from the year 1975. My time machine is a stationary mass temporal displacement unit manufactured by General Electric. The unit is powered by two top-spin dual positive singularities that produce a standard offset tippler sinusoid. I will be happy to post pictures of the unit. This was Teeter's first message. Immediately, believers and disbelievers alike started questioning John Teeter. He responded with precise answers, detailed schematics, and even predictions of the future. According to Teeter's subsequent posts, he revealed that he was chosen to travel back in time because his paternal grandfather had been involved with the assembly and programming of an IBM 5100 computer, which had the ability to help save the future. Teeter had traveled back in time to 1975 to obtain the computer and made a stopover in the year 2000 to collect family keepsakes that were lost to him in a future civil war. In an interesting parallel, the fictional John Galt had a special electrical motor that gave him the ability to help rebuild the world after an inevitable and widespread government collapse. Teeter's messages also included details of his time machine, which seemed to be made of highly scientific parts. In addition to the device features he described in his very first post, Teeter shared that his time machine also contained two magnetic housing units for dual micro-singularities, an electron injection manifold to alter mass and gravity of micro-singularities, four main cesium clocks, three main computer units, gravity sensors, and a cooling and x-ray venting system. In the style of Back to the Future, Teeter claimed his time machine device was installed in the back of a car, but instead of a clunky DeLorean, Teeter traveled through time in a much sleeker 1967 Chevrolet Corvette convertible. Along with these elements of his mission and his time machine, Teeter revealed other, quote, facts, unquote, of the future, which were composed of oddly specific details. Time travel, Teeter claimed, was invented in 2034 by General Electric. He himself was an American soldier based out of Tampa, Florida, who started his service by joining a shotgun infantry in 2011. He noted that in the future, people spend much more time reading and talking together face to face. Religion is taken seriously and everyone can multiply and divide in their heads. Teeter even touched on the topic of UFOs, which he noted were still mysterious in 2036, though he suggested that UFOs and extraterrestrials may also be time travelers, though from a far more advanced future than that of 2036. Between November 2000 and March 2001, John Teeter posted many messages and responded to many questions from believers and skeptics alike, but his sudden online emergence and his equally sudden disappearance gave rise to a number of important questions that are still unanswered. Was John Teeter a real person? Were the messages of time travel O oh, just a hoax? Is there any concrete proof of Teeter's claims? It has been over 17 years since John Teeter's final farewell post, but the speculation about his existence continues. Was it all an elaborate hoax? As with any subject dealing with the unknown, the unproven, and the extraordinary, there are many who are skeptical of the veracity of Teeter's identity and claims. Is the story of John Teeter one of the biggest hoaxes of the early 21st century? Several key clues point us to yes. The biggest evidence of a hoax are the future predictions John Teeter announced to the message boards. Most of them never came true. Teeter's most dire prediction foretold of a civil war in the United States. It would begin, he said, in 2004, as civil unrest surrounding the presidential election, quote, order and rights, unquote, would be the main source of conflict, and, quote, Waco-type event every month that gets steadily worse, unquote, would occur until the war fully escalated in 2008. The result would leave the United States divided into five new regions, but that wouldn't be the end. Teeter further predicted that the U.S. Civil War would be the trigger that sparked World War III in 2015. One possible cause involved border clashes and overpopulation. World War III would see nuclear tax exchange with Russia, and though the war would be brief, three billion people would end up dead. Fortunately for the world, these events never happened. Other of Teeter's less frightening predictions also never came to pass, but most maintained the same level of elaboration. For instance, Teeter claimed that there would be no official Olympics held after 2008, but they were anticipated to begin again in 2040. After World War III, which he called End Day, he named Omaha, Nebraska as the new capital of the United States. Teeter also warned of the Kreutzfeldt jacob disease, a fatal degenerative brain disorder being spread through beef products. The disease is rare, seeing less than 1,000 cases per year, but Teeter seemed to believe the threat of it was imminent, and he tried to warn the public for months. 
To date, there have been no outbreaks of Creutzfeldt jacob disease. Lending further credence to John Teeter is a hoax is the widespread belief that he was manufactured by Lawrence Haber, an internet lawyer based in Florida, and his brother, Maury Haber, a computer expert. Their involvement was suspected after an Italian TV program in 2008 used a private investigator to hunt down more information about John Teeter. While the investigator found no evidence of the existence of an actual John Teeter, he did discover that the Habers appeared to have a heavy involvement in all things related to Teeter. For instance, Larry Haber is the CEO of the for-profit John Teeter Foundation, which was established in 2003 and holds a copyright on the military insignia design that John Teeter stated was the symbol of the 177th military unit. Maury Haber, as a computer programmer at the turn of the 21st century, had the technical knowledge to perpetuate such an online hoax. Larry Haber also claimed to represent John Teeter's mother, Kay Teeter, who, like Teeter himself, has never been seen in the flesh. For those who have time to watch, independent investigator John Razimus created a nearly two-hour-long video that claims to have the, quote, smoking gun, unquote, evidence which reveals Maury Haber to be the man behind John Teeter. The more one attempts to research, the more it appears that the figure of John Teeter, whether fabricated or the Habers or some other party, is in fact a work of science fiction. But could it be true? Despite evidence to Ginnick, could John Teeter and his time-traveling ability be true? As the saying goes, anything is possible. There are still many believers of the John Teeter legend, and they are quick to point out that even though his predictions didn't come to fruition, the information he disclosed was too elaborate to be falsified. One interesting piece of evidence that gives believers hope, and could give non-believers pause, lies in the 5100 IBM computer that Teeter allegedly returned to the past to obtain. When asked about his mission, Teeter explained that he needed a 5100 IBM model because of its ability to debug and emulate code between various programming languages which they were lacking in 2036. He stated that this feature was accidentally added to the 5100 by IBM, but was never disclosed to the public remaining hidden and then removed from future models. After Teeter's claim was posted online, 5100 IBM engineer Bob Dubke confounded the public by confirming that IBM had in fact hidden this functionality in the 5100 and never released the fact. So how did Teeter know? Another theory of Teeter truthers, which is more logical speculation than true evidence, explains away his unrealized predictions quite simply. Teeter's mission changed the future, so his predictions couldn't come to pass. In one of his messages, Teeter shared that, quote, As far as the future goes, your world line is about 2.5% different than mine. As far as I can tell, you are headed toward the same events I would call, quote, my history, unquote, in 2036. But he follows up this statement with one that stands as his get-out-of-jail-free card for everything, like the entire future, that would come after him, quote, However, the very nature of time travel states that every world line is unique, and you are very much in control of what you do and how you get there, unquote. So, did we somehow alter the future after Teeter shared his predictions? Did his mission change the events of intervening years between his journey back in time and his return home? Or maybe, with the 2.5% difference between world lines, Teeter simply got some dates wrong, and his predictions are still yet to come. If you recall... Teeter's worst predictions included civil unrest surrounding a presidential election, order and rights, war with Russia, border clashes, and a divided U.S. Arguably, the 2016 presidential election elicited more civil unrest than the United States has seen in many years, if ever. Fueling some of the unrest were, and still are, issues of order, rights, and borders, not to mention tensions over Russia relations. Division in the U.S. is also arguably at an all-time high as political parties fight over endless irreconcilable differences. Also in recent years, a nuclear World War III has never been more of a possibility as the U.S., Russia, and North Korea frequently find themselves in the midst of escalating hostilities. These points are mere speculation, but the similarities to Teeter's predictions, though off by 12 years, are eerie. If we consider that Teeter's predictions were true, but shifted slightly in time as our world line altered, there is always the possibility that the same or a similar chilling future still is on the horizon. The loophole of an ever-shifting, flexible future may be very well the strongest argument in John Teeter's favor. Goodbye for now, or goodbye for good. After multiple posts and warnings, John Teeter disappeared as mysteriously as he emerged. On March 24, 2001, he shared his last message, which you can read here. Believers and non-believers together were left looking for answers to different questions 
Was John Teeter a time-traveling soldier who materialized to warn us about the future, or was he the first great internet hoax? Though clear answers to these questions would certainly solve a long-standing mystery, the answer, surprisingly, may not be what matters most. John Teeter, real or hoax, knew his story may not be believed, and he did not care. Instead, when he took leave of the internet in 2001, he used some of his posts to address the state of present-day society. In one message, Teeter wrote, quote, Perhaps I should let you all in on a little secret. No one likes you in the future. This time period is looked at as being full of lazy, self-centered, civilly ignorant sheep. Perhaps you should be less concerned about me and more concerned about that. Looking at this blunt message through the lens of today's tense political climate and schisms between many people groups, it is a sentiment that feels both the timely and cautionary. It is also not the only time Teeter alluded to the negative aspects of the present-day world that he was addressing. Several of his messages included warnings, directly and indirectly, about our society as a whole. Still, others mention how the future, no matter its anticipated trajectory, always has the possibility of being changed. Whether one believes Teeter's story or not, these messages still offer comments reflective of our world, compelling us to take at least a moment to evaluate the present and wonder at how it could be altered going forward. Although he shared numerous posts on a variety of subjects, in the end, could the figure of John Teeter have really been some sort of moral compass trying to point the way to a different future? After all, what is it that matters most? Whether we believe John Teeter's story or whether we believe in shaping the future ourselves? In Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand created the character of John Galt as a 20th century symbol of change in a failing world. Through his anonymous identity and clues he left behind him, Galt became a figure of legend, altering the future behind a curtain of mystery. Similarly, John Teeter, or whoever created him, also managed to construct an enduring legend. Even if he is a work of fiction, some of his messages, clues he offered about the present-day 21st century, have a ring of truth. And if he really is a man, not just a myth, then time travel and the many possible futures available to us mean it's all more important that we, the future we end up in, is of our own making. Will it be as John Teeter predicted? Will the world line change for better or for worse? Who is John Teeter? Although I do have personal reasons for being here and speaking with you, the most I could hope for is that you recognize the possibility of time travel as a reality. You are able to change your world line for the better or worse. Just as I am, John Teeter.
Okay, today we have a great guest coming on. We have Bill Sheehan. Bill, how you doing, man? Super duper, Tony. Very good to be here. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm glad you're here. Uh, you know, I first heard about you on Wes's show, and I've heard you uh, doing different appearances on other shows and stuff, and you have quite the collection of Bigfoot experiences. Uh, one of the most impressive collections I've ever seen out there. Uh, the title of your book series, it's a book series, ladies and gentlemen, is Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters. You have, I think you said you had four volumes out right now and you're working on six and seven or no, I think you said five and six is out now, right? Yeah, I have six volumes out and I'm in the middle of uh, seven. Got you. Okay. So it's Bigfoot Terror in the Woods, Sightings and Encounters. There's different volumes of them. The, you go by W.J. Sheehan. And everybody calls you Bill, but so anybody who's looking for it, that's what you're looking for. Bigfoot terror in the woods, sightings and encounters. And trust me, after tonight's show, you're definitely going to get your hands on all of his volumes. So Bill, uh, you started writing these books and documenting people's encounters. How the heck did you go about doing this? Well, uh, you know, I'm glad you like my restaurant. You like to eat the food. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm not going to I'm not going to give you all of my recipes but uh let me say this that the old tried and true methodology uh prior to the internet uh in the form of uh perhaps running ads local newspapers putting in the time the money and the effort uh is really what it's all about to get the ball rolling, uh, gathering these stories. Now, in my books now, uh, inside of every cover, I have a little blurb that says, if you've seen something, say something. And I put my email there, which is splinters at optonline.net. And uh, through that, uh, other people are coming forward. Uh, as they're reading the books and they're saying, hey, you know, I'm going to call this guy up and run this by him, which is exactly what happened this morning, as a matter of fact, uh, with a guy from New Hampshire. Uh, So I just, I am a writer. I have a blog. Uh, I've done some writing in the past. And uh, uh, so I have a love for writing. And I also have a love for the topic of uh, Bigfoot. So it was really a marriage made in heaven uh, uh, that I would uh, tip my hat into this. And really, I wanted to hear uh, more about Bigfoot. I wanted to dig deeper, uh, being certain that there had to be more people out there that were encountering this thing and needed an outlet or a conduit uh, to speak about what happened to them. And then I started running across. Now, mind you, uh, Tony, I'm 60 years old. I'm not the big computer guy. Uh, I use a computer for my own purposes. I'm on three computers in the medical profession that I'm in in the hospital. But as far as really knowing the ins and outs and dialing in all these computers and podcasts and all this other jazz, I kind of just learn a little bit here and there as I go, and I started to listen to podcasts. I didn't even know what a podcast was. And uh, one thing led to another. I got an iPod, and a few people showed me how to use the iPod. And next thing you know, I found some shows on Bigfoot, uh, and I started listening to them, and I said, wow, this is outrageous, man. There's people on here talking it up about Bigfoot. Prior to that, my entire Bigfoot experience was a handful of shows that we've all seen a dozen times that air on TV periodically. Uh, the Patterson-Gimlin film, uh, a few odds and ends here and there. That was my experience with Bigfoot. Uh, up until the point uh, I decided to throw my hat into the ring. Yeah, you know, it's funny you said that earlier and stuff, how, you know, it, it really is just the old fashioned way of just grinding something out and putting the time and effort in, the money into it and stuff. And I, 
I have the same story when it comes to like how I went about building my show. Everybody knows that I'm close with Wes Gerber from Sasquatch Chronicles. He really helped me uh, get inspired to do the show. But it wasn't Wes doing the, you know, until two, three o'clock in the morning working on the podcast when the family's sleeping kind of thing. It really is just getting out there and grinding it and putting the time and effort in and trusting that you're going to see the fruits of your labor down the road, not knowing when that's going to come. Yeah. And here's the thing, Tony. I have thousands upon thousands upon thousands, and did I say thousands, <laughs> of dollars, of dollars invested in what you're hearing and the books that people can buy. And the amount of hours that I have invested in this is incalculable. I don't even know where to begin or when hour one started. It's just something you do because you want to do and you don't consider how it began or where it will end. It's simply what you do. And this is my involvement now in this project. I just go on and on and on until, frankly, if there comes a point where I'm like, okay, enough is enough. But I don't really see that happening. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I The fact that you've gathered this many stories, uh, I think you got the ball rolling by now, and it's just a snowball that's just going to keep growing. And uh, I know I'm speaking for many people that have heard you speak before and stuff about your stories. Uh, it is a pleasure. So keep them coming. Uh, why don't you start us off tonight? Uh, you have many different stories you'd like to share with us from your books. Uh, please take it away, sir. All right. So uh, first of all, thanks to your audience for uh, listening in. Uh, I'm glad to be a part of this show tonight with you, Tony. And uh, I'm going to come out of the gate here with a very interesting uh, sighting. Uh, that I entitled The Grizzly Encounter. Uh, this account was brought to my attention by a fellow named Sam Longfooter, who just happens to be an American Indian. Uh, I had joked with Sam on our interview about someone with his last name having the encounter, which you'll soon hear. But uh, here is what uh, Sam Longfooter had to say. In 2008, we were going up into the Tongass National Forest region for a grizzly bear hunt, Alaskan style. Having flown into Ketchikan, we had arranged for a guide service to meet up with us. He had a 36-foot trawler-style ship with a 20-foot aluminum tender in tow. The plan being to get us in close proximity via the Beam Canal to where we would hunt. Thereafter, we would anchor the trawler and take the skiff up into the Unuk River to establish our camp and begin the hunt. I'm not going to lie to you. You can easily die on a grizzly hunt, and many have through the years. You can do everything right and have your gun jam at the critical moment in which you are firing your shot and be mauled to death. I always hunt grizzly with one or two armed men besides myself for this reason. And yes, the gun jamming has actually happened to me personally with a grizzly charging at us from 75 feet away. If my guide had not been at the ready, I would not be here with you today. My guide for this hunt was a well-seasoned old-timer who knew this area well. When it came to grizzlies, he was renowned for his ability to consistently score the largest of the large. The plan was to take the tender into the zone each day from the main ship and hunt the woods, returning to the main ship every afternoon to eat and sleep until we found our mark. The forest by the river is perpetually damp and shadowy. Its floor is covered predominantly in a layer of thick, spongy green moss, 
which silences not only our steps, but those of the bears as well. This, at times, makes one ask the question, just who is stalking who? For if you are not careful, the tables can be swiftly turned, leaving you wishing that you had never been born. On our first day in, we had come across numerous tracks that were fresh and large. We also had located numerous tree scrapes, indicating a large bear was in the area. That afternoon, it started to rain and rain hard. I had learned many years ago to leave the woods if it started to rain while hunting bear. Sound is such a critical aspect that to have it drowned out by a noisy rainfall can prove to be deadly. And so it was that we left the woods for the remainder of the day. Unfortunately, it kept raining through the night as well as well as into the following day. So we had made the decision as a group to stay put in the ship until the weather became more favorable. On the third day, we were back in the woods. The forest was soaked. As we walked, our boots were sinking into the moss three to four inches with every step that we took. The bear's prints, which we had seen the other day, were quite large, indicating that a seriously big bear was on the prowl. At times in here, we couldn't see with clarity more than 30 feet ahead or to the side of us. Knowing that a large grizzly could cover ground quickly, we were all on edge. We were making our way in deep when we ran across a second set of prints that were not from a bear. Immediately, we all knew what they were from. These prints were well over 24 inches long and 10 inches wide. Some of them were at least a foot deep or more into the moss. We were now following the tracks of a bear and a Sasquatch. This was quite a duo to be in the woods with, and not being able to hear nor see them could prove to be devastating. We had been tracking what we believed to be a thousand pound bear based on the size of its tracks, and now based on the size of the Sasquatch tracks, God only knows what this thing would weigh in at. I was not ignorant of the beast, and neither was my guide. This was an extremely dicey and dangerous situation, but curiosity had gotten the best of us, and we moved forward. There were hundreds and hundreds of tracks laid down in line with each other, moving off in the direction we were now heading. It was then that the realization came upon me that there were no longer that we were no longer interested in the grizzly. We were now stalking a Sasquatch through this dense and treacherous forest. It must have been about an hour into our hike, with the trail having not gone cold in the least. We started to break out of the damp forest into a clearing filled with tall grass and clusters of trees. This was the absolute worst case scenario imaginable for stalking a bear or anything else. A grizzly could come busting out of here at any moment and be on us before we knew what happened. We weren't making a sound as we walked, like we were walking on a mattress with bare feet. It was almost instantaneous that as we entered this field, a stench of what I can only describe as being raw, fresh crap hit all of our nostrils at the same time. It was the foulest smelling odor that you could imagine, and it was overwhelming us almost to the point of gagging. As we, st as we stood there, some areas of the grass and brush ahead of us appeared to be some six feet tall or better. While we were coming to grips with this stench and what was before us, a huge figure started to rise up out of the grass some 50 feet from where we stood. As soon as we saw it, we knew what it was. We ducked down in unison, and although we were hidden, the problem now was that we couldn't see what we knew was the Sasquatch. 
if he should decide to turn and retrace his steps, it would surely be a gunfight. As we sat squatting, we could hear some grunting sounds coming from the beast. Then everything went quiet. We wouldn't dare stand up and remain squatting with our guns pointed straight ahead for some 30 minutes or more, expecting that at any moment the grass in front of us would part, revealing this hideous monster. I was the first one who actually stood to my feet to have a look-see. It was safe, and I waved for the guide to back out of where we were. We made it all the way back to the tender and then to the ship, having made the decision to quit the hunt for the day. To a man, we believed that the Sasquatch was squatting in the brush, relieving itself, and had just stood up with its back to us as we ducked down. The following day, we were not prepared to give up on this location, knowing that a huge grizzly was on the prowl. We put the gear in the skiff and once again went ashore. We began to scout out the forest in the same way we had the day before, but we're not coming across any new grizzly tracks other than the ones from the previous day's hunt. <coughs> Excuse me. In similar fashion to the day before, about an hour into the hunt, we once again came upon a new set of Sasquatch prints. Only this time, there were two sets of tracks paralleling each other. There were many of them, with one set being much larger than the other. Our hunch at the time was that the grizzly had moved out, either because of the competition or perhaps it wasn't willing to put up a territorial fight for its domain. This was all a guess because we really don't know anything about the relationships between these creatures. But the facts being what they were, the bear was gone, and now there were two Sasquatch in the area. The day before, as the Sasquatch began to stand, we squatted down immediately upon seeing him. Having said as much, I still saw that his body, not yet standing fully erect, was at least four feet taller than the surrounding grass. I'm six feet tall, and some of the grass was taller than me. We knew that this larger Sasquatch was at the very least all of 11 to 12 feet tall. Additionally, we already knew the size of its feet, having tracked it through the forest and into the field. We had decided yet again to track these two sets as far as we could without getting into a compromised position as we had the day before. It must have been at least a mile or more into the stalk when we came upon a large decaying tree on the ground covered in moss. The tree, for the most part, in the, set, uh, in the center of its remaining trunk, had been freshly torn apart. Both sets of prints were present, overlapping each other around the entire trunk. We knew now that these Sasquatch were more than likely harvesting grubs from the decaying tree. It's funny, but this type of thing, which is actually taught in survival, oh, this is the type of thing that's actually taught in survivalist training. Grubs can serve as a source of food for humans who find themselves in dire straits. Unwilling to carry on the search any further, having come for a grizzly and not a Sasquatch, we aborted the hunt and went back to the ship. Pretty bizarre, huh? Yeah, that's incredible. That I'll tell you what, that's one way to open up the show, man. That story is incredible. How long ago did that happen? Um, 2008. Wow. So it's actually really in recent times. Yeah. Everything that I'm sharing with you tonight is less than 20 years old. Jeez. Wow. That's incredible. So, and I like that. Let me, uh, pardon me just for a second. I don't know why I'm sitting in front of the computer, not touching anything. And suddenly it went into, uh, a, uh, update mode. So I just gotcha. shut it off. <laughs> gotcha. No problem. Yeah, just uh, incredible. Uh, you know, again, we have a professional hunter here with a guide. Uh, I'm sure he spent maximum dollars for this situation that he was in with the ship and the tender. And, the, you know, uh, this must have been like a $10,000 or $20,000 hunt for him. And, 
they knew what they were looking at. They knew what the tracks were. They knew the dangers. Uh, they were well aware. And uh, still they had the guts or the stupidity uh, to go back in uh, a second time around. But I think common sense got the best of them uh, after having tracked this pair of footprints going up to this uh, torn apart uh, decayed tree. I, I think they just said to themselves, you know what, guy, let's uh, let's walk away from this while we can still walk. It was a wise move. That was a wise move. Because I know for you collecting these stories, I'm sure you've come across stories that are not happy endings where these things get more aggressive. Yeah, well, uh, the next story I'm going to share with you uh, was actually an attack. Uh, and again, things to me happen when people act. Uh, foolishly. Uh, now, that's not to say you can't stumble upon something and just be attacked. Uh, you're talking about wild beasts, whether it's uh, a mountain lion, a uh, grizzly bear, uh, Sasquatch. Uh, the tables can be turned in quickly, uh, and you're not going to know what hit you. But there are also people who just act foolishly. They just can't go through life and not be doing something stupid. You know what I mean? Yes. And uh, my experience says that this carries over uh, into the realm of Bigfoot as well. You know, and to be honest with you, Tony, if I found myself in most of these situations, uh, I never would have tracked the Bigfoot into the field where they were. That's me personally. Uh, even with a gun in my hand, I would not continue on the track of this set of prints that was going on, on and on and on and on after this. Now, that's just me. Uh, I would track the grizzly, but I don't think I'm tracking a Bigfoot. I'll be honest with you, you know. Uh, if I saw a Bigfoot from a distance, I think I'd be more inclined to uh, hang out, check it out, as long as I felt the situation was safe. But knowing what I know now about these creatures, uh, the speed at which they can move, the strength which they possess, no, 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 no. I am not, uh, I'm not getting in range of these creatures where they could get the jump on me or get their hands on me. Because it would be all over and in a hurry. Yeah, I, I, you know, I got my start in, you know, looking around for Bigfoot myself and stuff. Never saw anything, but uh, I hear more and more stories of people going and having some pretty dramatic things happen, and it does make you kind of step back and second guess what you're doing out there, you know? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I've said this before, and I'll say it to you and the audience tonight. We have TV shows that are showing people walking around in the woods unarmed with infrared cameras and, you know, walking around in the woods uh, hoping to meet up with this creature. I mean, I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know what they're thinking, but it's not what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not what yes. I'm thinking. I totally you know, agree. If, if I'm in the woods with them, I got a big piece on me and a lot of ammunition. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'll start firing before I ask any questions. Yeah, bring that elephant gun. You know, something with big ammo. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you a funny story. It has nothing to do with this. Uh, I had a friend uh, was in Vietnam. Uh, crazy man, absolutely crazy man, and uh, he told me that. Uh, they would sit behind a sandbag perimeter uh, in a compound in the jungle. And they actually had something like a traffic light set up. And when the light hit one color, everything was cool. Uh, when another color came on, it was like, you know, everybody in the compound, get ready. In other words, that indicated that something had been seen. 
And then when the light went to uh, whatever it was, let's just say red, uh, all hell broke loose. And he told me that the guys used to lay behind the sandbag pile, which was the closest perimeter to the encampment. And then as it went out, they had claymore mines, barbed wire, razor wire, all kinds of barriers that somebody would have to get through to get to them. And he said they would lay the guns over the top of the sandbags, not even looking where they were shooting, just like holding the gun level and spraying clip after clip of automatic weapon fire uh, into the woods until they were told to stop. <laughs> wow. And I said to myself, now that's how you hunt Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Just spray it. You know, just spray it until you hear it scream and then pick up the pieces. I, I don't, I have no interest in meeting one of these things face to face. I'm absolutely certain of it. Absolutely certain yeah. of it. I had, uh, I have an account where one of these, uh, creatures tore both of the barn doors off with the hinges and the cross bolts and everything. I mean, just ripped them off the building. Jeez. You know, you couldn't do that with hammers and crowbars. I mean, it would be a huge undertaking, you know what I mean? And just like, <laughs> tearing it out and just crashing it down onto the ground like it was uh, uh, pulling a bag out of a wastebasket. Yeah. I mean, this is just, we have no understanding of this type of strength. It's just incredible. It's off the charts. Right. And when I think yep. about it, I have I have a 13-month-old at home. And it's my first child. And, you know, he's doing things, moving things around and stuff. And, you know, I help him do stuff. And I think to myself, you know, the strength that I have compared to him is probably very similar to what I have compared to a Sasquatch. You know, it's just like you can't yeah. even fathom it. No, it's just uh, it's just really bizarre. Uh, anyways, uh, let me throw you a curve here. This uh, this story I titled the Mount Rose Trail Night Encounter, and uh, when we talk about as we just were, how you could get in trouble in a hurry. Uh, this story pretty much tells the tale of uh, don't look for trouble because you may find it. These guys, uh, this story was brought to my attention by a guy, and believe it or not, this is actually his name, Billy Bills. Wow. Uh, uh, Billy Bills. Uh, from this point forward, uh, it'll be Billy and his hiking partner, Rex, sharing the events that they experienced during their night hike. Uh, Rex and I had done this hike numerous times during different months of the year each providing us with a different set of challenges. In particular, during the winter, the snow near the summit can be waist deep. Regardless of that, during any winter or even late spring hikes, you will most definitely need walking poles and spikes. This is an extremely difficult hike in anyone's book, and I'm sure many people have turned back after having begun it. The left side of this trail can be quite treacherous presenting you with many switchbacks and some very steep inclines which you in which you are more mountain climbing than hiking. And then he gives some directions here, actually how to get to this trail, uh, which I'm actually going to skip over. There are several things I will caution your listeners about. During this hike, you were virtually enclosed in the forest the entire time. And on many occasions, after you reach the summit, you find that you were encased in a fog obscuring all of your views. From the top, you can see Mounts Rainier, Adams, and St. Helens. Further off in the distance, you are looking at the Olympics, and below you is Lake Cushman, which is breathtaking in and of itself. There are also times of the year when the yellow jackets are swarming. 
There are so many of them that you can loudly hear them as you are approaching, and they will attack you. Now that I have thoroughly discouraged you, let me say that when things and conditions go right, this hike is one for the books. Well worth the effort. Although it is touted to be some 5.5 miles in length, on my GPS, I have clocked it at more or less seven and a half miles. I would also advise anyone to bring twice as much water as they think they will need and if you have soft feet, bring Band-Aids as well. So we're getting into this. Guy was very descriptive, and I like to include as many details as I can uh, that the people uh, bring to the table. The last time that Billy and I were in here, we hiked up on a cougar that was less than 10 feet from the trail, and it took off like a rocket. This time around, we were planning to do our second night hike. There are absolutely no words to describe sitting at the summit at 4 a.m. under the canopy of the night sky. I actually pity humanity for not experiencing such beauty in their lifetime. Rex and I were getting set to go. It was about 1.15 a.m. when we began the hike. It was late July of 2010, and the night was pristine, to say the least. Being well familiar with this trail, we made it to the summit in about two and a half hours. I must warn you that the hike begins at about 700 feet of elevation, and at the peak, you were at 4,300 feet. I only say that because this hike is steep and arduous the entire time that you are in it. Having achieved the summit, we laid back on our packs enveloped by the night sky. As I was laying there, I felt as though the sky was drawing me into itself, and I was thinking that I was at one with the universe. Mere words cannot describe what we were feeling at the time. After about 90 minutes or so, we began our descent down the right-hand side of the mount. This side is somewhat easier than the left, and of course, we were now going downhill as well. I must say, for those of you who are night, not uh, night owls, your eyes actually do get quite accustomed to the dark, and you could see reasonably well, all things considered. On this trail, you are literally in the trees the entire time, with only a few occasional breaks overlooking the slopes and some well-dispersed living and dead timber. It was during one of these breaks that I was certain I had seen something large and dark move quickly across a small clearing on the slope. The area it had moved across was maybe 30 or 40 feet away, tops, and it was very tall and large. We conversed briefly, kicking around as to what it could have been, and continued our hike. A few minutes later, both of us heard what was clearly some rocks and debris tumbling down the same slope to our right. Now understand me, please. When you are in these conditions hiking in the dark, your senses are most certainly heightened, and we began to feel like we were being stalked and or watched, and we were far from reaching the bottom. The difficulty became keeping our focus on the trail and our footing in the dark while still being acutely aware that something was definitely flanking our movements on the slope. We kept walking all the while still hearing noises which were becoming increasingly unnerving to the two of us. At this point in time, we were not keeping silent and were actually shouting things like, go away, and trying to scare off whatever this was. We had just passed through a switchback that opens up into about a 150-foot foot somewhat straight run of trail ahead of us when we both came to a sudden halt. Ahead of us, maybe 75 feet away, was a glaring pair of bright red eyes peering directly at us in the darkness. 
These eyes were set very widely apart and were more than 10 feet from the ground. In the moment, I felt that they were almost having a hypnotic effect on me, but I tried to focus on the rest of the image that was before us. Even in the darkness, I could make out a clear outline of something of enormous stature that was rocking from side to side. As we were standing there, looking at these eyes, Billy was standing slightly behind me on the trail. He had bent down to grab a large rock and hurled it at this thing, hitting it squarely as he shouted, Get the hell out of here! Well, when I tell you that all hell broke loose, that would be an understatement. This thing let out a screaming roar that words can't describe. I thought it would knock us down, and it was deafening to our ears. The two of us turned simultaneously to run back up the trail. I don't think we were 30 feet into our retreat when I heard uh, Rex let out a scream. I turned, and Rex was now on his back, laying on the ground groaning, as this beast was now standing over him, screaming with its mouth wide open and contorting its upper body. I was now maybe 10 feet away from an enormous, roaring Bigfoot uh, standing over my best friend. In the heat of the moment, I guess I did what anyone would have done. I took one of my walking sticks, which were nothing more than winter ski poles with the uh, the rings removed, and I flung it at this beast's sidearm like a whirling sword. God was with us that day because it hit him squarely in the face. I believe it hit him right in the eye. I say that because the beast immediately put both of its hands to its face and started screaming, staggering around on the trail. I now had Rex on the ground reeling in pain and a Bigfoot staggering around screaming. I didn't think it was 10 seconds later that the Bigfoot, while holding its hands to its face, lost its footing on the edge of the trail and fell off the side, tumbling down the slope. I knew I had to move and move quickly, so I ran to Rex. As I tried to grab him, he said that his shoulder was broken. He couldn't move his arm, and he was in obvious pain. I told him, Brother, you have to get up, or this thing will kill us. We have to move now. I pulled his pack off, got him to his feet, and we started moving downward. Rex was writhing in pain, but he was moving, and this Bigfoot was screaming and howling on the side of the slope behind us. I think a combination of adrenaline and fear had taken over Rex, because he was now moving quickly with my help. For some 15 minutes, we could still hear this beast groaning and screaming behind us. In the moment, I could only think about David slaying Goliath in the biblical narrative with one smooth stone. Eventually, the sounds of the beast were gone, and we had covered a considerable distance. We reached a point where we could now see that the sun was beginning to rise, and all I could think of was that we were now safe. It's funny now. But in my mind, I actually thought of Dracula not being able to stand sunlight. And I was thinking the same thing about the Bigfoot. All that Billy has been telling you is exactly as it happened. We were now nearing the trailhead in the safety of our vehicle. When we finally got to the car, another vehicle was pulling over to begin the day's hike. When they saw us and the condition that I was in, they asked us what had happened. I needed medical attention, so we wasted no time. We told them that we had been attacked by a Bigfoot that was still up there somewhere and that we had hit him in the eye with a ski pole and ran. Their jaws dropped. We jumped in the car and took off, and we could see them do the same. When we made it to the hospital, the doctor asked us what happened, and you can imagine what that led to. After some x-rays were taken, we found that Rex had a fractured clavicle, 
which although it was quite painful, was not as bad as it could have been. And after a sling was uh, applied, he was feeling a lot better. Uh, I then wrote in here that I then asked the boys to fill in any of the details surrounding the event. uh, And here is what they had to say. Uh, As you already know, Bill, this all happened quite a few years ago. But when we were in the hospital, Rex told me that as soon as we had started to attempt running back up the trail, this creature had grabbed his backpack, slamming him to the rocky ground on his back. He knew immediately that something had broken in his body. Rex said that his body was shaking as this thing stood over him, roaring down at him. This was obviously retribution for being hit with the rock. And who knows, it may have killed both of us right there and then. Even in the darkness, when we were finally all in close quarters, I could see the immensity of this beast. I thought I would collapse from fear alone right on the spot. But something welled up within me and I hurled the ski pole. I guess it was an all or nothing at all fight or flight response. And to be honest with you, I believe there was some divine intervention working for me with that ski pole's flight that night because I firmly believe that the pointed end went right into its eye. The way this thing was staggering and screaming, falling off the side of the slope, he had to have had his eye knocked out. When I was on the ground and I looked up, seeing this thing leaning over me, I cannot tell you how frightened I was. Billy saved our lives that day, I am sure. If it wasn't for his quick thinking and reaction, I believe it would have killed us or maimed us both. I was 15 feet away from it when I let the pole fly, and it had to be 12 feet tall and as wide as a barn door. The sound of its roar actually made the skin on my face vibrate. It had to have weighed well over a 1,000 pounds or more And that may well be an understatement. We have never gone back there again and wonder every day about those who do. Wow. Yeah. That's terrifying. Freaking unbelievable. Jeez. To talk about... So you go... Go ahead. I was just going to say, you talk about the luck or... I don't know what it was. Maybe God was on your side to be able to have that kind of accuracy to hit it in a spot where it's actually going to deter the thing. To me, I don't think, I don't think the guy's intent was anything other than to wing the pole. I mean, he just said he threw the, the, the ski pole, like a, like a whirl gig or a Frisbee, just letting it wing. And, uh, you know, as fate would have it, he believed that the pointy end actually wound up in a swirling flight, this 15, 20 feet right in this bugger's eye. I don't see. I don't think if the if the side of the ski pole had slapped him, uh, the screaming and the holding and the of staggering off the side of the trail would have yeah. occurred. He just would have maybe been more pissed off. But uh, it it sounded to me, and what can I go by other than what he said, that he believed that the end found its mark, which was nothing less than like a miracle or something of sorts. You know, like holy cow, Absolutely. you know. Yeah, I mean. If the thing even it, even if it stabbed it anywhere else in the body, it wouldn't have reacted that way. You know, it had to be an incredibly sensitive area that it actually struck. Yeah, and I mean, just if I think of myself, if I get something in my eye, even like a, uh, you know, how when you get something in your eye, it feels like there's a freaking brick in there. Yeah, the world's coming to and- an end. Yeah, it just could be something little or small or nothing. But when it gets in there, all you could think about is the blinking and the tearing, and I got to get this thing out of my eye. That becomes your top priority. I can't even imagine getting you know a stick jabbed in your eye to the point where you're blinded. I mean, you're no longer thinking about the guy that you knocked down anymore. Uh, you know, man or animal, you're, I think you're, you're kind of staggering around and maybe running away or doing something, you know? Yeah. Can you imagine what that thing looks like today? It's probably one ugly SOB now with a jacked up eye. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that you talk about the jacked up eye. I didn't have this prepared tonight, but 
Uh, the last conversation I had with Wes, he said to me, did you read the account of the one-eyed Sasquatch? So I told him I didn't. And he briefly told me that he had a fellow that encountered, uh, I think he threw the flashlight on what he was seeing and realized why he was only seeing one eye because the, the other eye in that area of the Sasquatch's face was all mutilated. And I think I mentioned to him, but if I didn't, I'll mention it to you. The thought came to my mind quickly. This one-eyed Sasquatch account or encounter occurred in Florida. And I had an account of a guy in Louisiana that I named the Snake Collector. And in the Snake Collector, oh, before I go in that direction, I started thinking to myself, hmm, Florida, Louisiana. And then I was thinking, what is capable of attacking a Bigfoot and mauling its eye? I mean, it have to be something very formidable to get at the eye and, and do a lot of damage. Well, in the Snake Collector, these two guys had met each other on the summer drag racing circuit. They both worked for different guys that had a team that toured the country. And in the course of their meetings, they were going head to head with other teams and whatnot at these drag strips. These two dudes became friends. So this one guy lives in Louisiana and he says to him, what do you do in your off time when you're not working the drag circuit? So the guy says to him, he collects snakes and he catches them with his bare hands. So this guy figured he had one too many beers in the pit, but he realized in talking to him that he was serious. And he says he sells them for good money to research labs and other facilities where they make anti-venom. So the long and short of it was this dude had told him, you got my number. If you're ever down in Louisiana, look me up and I'll show you a good time. Well, the time comes when he calls him and he goes to Louisiana and hooks up with this dude. He takes him out into the swamp at night in his boat. He's got a spotlight rigged up on it. He's got a outboard and an electric motor. And he takes him into the swamp area and the guy says, I was completely lost. If something had happened to him that night or the mo motor and I was alone, I would have no idea how we got where we were. Well, this guy would kill the motor, turn the electric on, and when he got into certain areas by the banks and whatnot, he started to use the spotlight looking for snakes. Some of them were swimming in the water, some of them were on the bushes, and sure as shooting, this dude was grabbing these suckers with his hands and shoving them in a bag. So, <laughs> I think it was the second or the third night, <coughs> excuse me, they go back in. Only this time, the guy pays attention to how he was doing, where he was turning, where he was going. So he was more comfortable with just being there and the idea of, like, I think I could get out of here if I had to. <laughs> well, he's hand-grabbing some snakes, and they're going very quietly through this uh, bayou, swampy area. Lights out. And they hear some enormous splashing going on somewhere up ahead of them in the dark. They kill the lights. When they came around this bend, he throws the light on. And standing there in this freaking bayou is a huge Bigfoot with about a six-foot-long gator limp in its hand. The Bigfoot looks at them. They look at it in the spotlight. It casually turns, hanging onto the gator steps out of the swamp and goes up into the woods. And I thought to myself, huh, well, Florida and Louisiana both have gators. But, you know, grabbing an alligator is a lot like grabbing a shark on the beach or in a boat. Those things can turn and thrash on you in a heartbeat. And I got to thinking that maybe this gator, the one-eyed Sasquatch in Florida, had an encounter with a gator where he got a little too loosey-goosey with it 
and this t- thing turned around and snapped him in his eye socket, blinding him and tearing his face up. You know, that's a real possibility. That's a real possibility because Gators, I never really thought about it before, but if there's something out there that really could um, do some damage to a Sasquatch, it, it's very limited as to what your options are in North America. Uh, you got grizzlies. I'm sure grizzly could do some damage. Uh, I don't think it would do enough, but I think it could do some damage. But a gator, man, you get those teeth on those things because don't gators have like a 2,500 pound bite? Well, it's ridiculous. And not to mention, uh, you know, when their mouth is open, I mean, it's, it's, it's looking, you know, it's worse than looking at sore teeth. I mean, there's just like a ridiculous amount of jagged, curling, nasty teeth coming out of there. Uh, and if they snapped at you and just slammed their uh, jaws shut, I mean, boy, you don't want to be in the receiving end of that. That's for sure, you know? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's interesting. <laughs> though. That's very, very interesting. Yeah, I just, I, I kind of, look, we have no proof of that. But I was trying to make a, a, a connection between the two events, and for some reason, that both located in that area of the United States, and both areas having that creature uh, in the area and in numbers, uh, I said to myself, "Wow, I wonder if this guy thing got a little too frisky, or got a little too ignorant of what he was doing and what he was wrestling with." And, uh, you know, turnabout became fair play and he became the victim. Yeah, I mean, it's very well uh, could be a possibility. It very well could be a possibility. Uh, th- those things are incredibly strong. And, uh, you, you know, it's fun to think about what the possibilities are. You know, what could take down a Sasquatch, you know, and all that other stuff. It's fun to think about it. But it's also I think it's a good thing to think about because uh, you never know when you're going to come across one of these things. And just to have a general idea of what your thoughts are on it uh, is preparation that I think is invaluable. Yeah, well, it could be. And as I told you, I really don't want to come across one because the event is so frightening to most of the people uh, in my encounters that, uh, you know, you have people that sell their homes, uh, never go hunting again, uh, give up, uh, their favorite hobby, uh, you know, and things like that just don't happen. You know, I mean, why do you give something up? You're too old to do it anymore. Maybe you're injured, you're injured and you can't do the same exercises you like to do. You know, I mean, there are reasons generally people give things up, and typically the reason is not fear. (laughs) I mean, when you when you get fear when you get fear taking a hold of you, now that's a whole other animal in and of itself. You know, one hundred percent fear. Fear makes us do things that we never thought we would do. You know, (laughs) so yeah, you know, fear can cause can bring out the good and the bad. You know, we know that many people act heroically and courageously uh, being hurled into certain situations that you would never expect. Uh, And other people, you know, cut bait and run, you know, and uh, you 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 just don't know how you're going to react. And, you know, God forbid, you should never be in that situation to find out, you know. Absolutely. Uh, But, yeah, these uh, these things are crazy. Uh, you know, now here is something on the gruesome side of things. Uh, no Sasquatch seen here, but, uh, what I'm about to present to you, well, let me get into it. And then you tell me if you don't think what I already think about this situation. I named this, uh, account, the jogger. Uh, and it'll become uh, more than apparent briefly why I chose that title. As I begin this tale with you, I have once again purposefully placed this account after the previous one, for it had occurred only miles south of where the men had been attacked in their tent. Some five years later, Here is what Wayne Enright had to say. So I put this in my book 
directly after an account where two men had been attacked. Uh, and if we get together another time, I'll share that one with you. But let me just stay going with the uh, jogger. It was getting late in the summer of 2003 when my friend and hunting partner Jerry and I were going to spend a Saturday scoping out a location to place our tree stands for the upcoming fall hunt. Our destination was northwest of Raymond between Willow Creek, St. Vrain Creek, and Finch Lake. Having hunted here before and done quite well, our hope was that this season would yield more of the same. Our custom was that we would find several locations which seemed promising. After we returned home, we would then decide on the exact spot to set up a week or so before the season began. Our day had yielded several very promising locations, yet, as fate would have it, on the return leg of our hike, we had decided to take somewhat of a last-minute detour for a look at another spot. The forest was really thick in here, and there were a number of heavily trafficked trails. As we followed one of them, it opened up into a small clearing within the trees. The two of us realized in the moment that this was really the best of the bunch, so to speak. We began to work the perimeter of the clearing, scoping out the best locations to position our stands. Having decided to divide and conquer, Jerry went in one direction while I went in the other saying to each other that we would give a shout if we found anything good. It was about 20 minutes later when I heard Jerry shouting at the top of his lungs, Hey, Wayne, you better come over here quick. As I ran into the clearing, Jerry was standing directly in front of me on the other side, waving his hand at me. I ran across to meet him. As he said to me, prepare yourself because I found a body. I followed his lead as we meandered through some thick brush following a game trail. As we rounded a corner, Jerry stopped and extended his arm pointing. I couldn't believe my eyes. In front of us was a large old pine the lower branches of which had long since died, being completely devoid of any green growth whatsoever. Draped over one of the lower branches, with a large dead stump of a limb protruding from her chest, was a female body, missing one limb and quite obviously dead. As I stood there looking at the corpse, the first thought that had entered my mind for whatever reason was that of Vlad the Impaler from Transylvania, who marked the trail leading up to his castle with his victim's bodies impaled on pointed stakes for his potential adversaries to peruse. This limb upon which the body was draped was at eye level which to me said that no human had done this. There was nothing to stand on and no reason, at least in my own mind, why someone would not only kill a person, but then go to such an extreme to create this gory display that we were now viewing. We knew it was a woman because a long black braid was hanging off the back of her head as her head slumped rearward towards the ground. The two of us noticed that the head appeared to be on the verge of falling off, with the neck giving the appearance of having been twisted or mangled in some way. Her right leg was still attached to the body, while the left leg was completely missing, from the hip socket down. On her right foot, there was an expensive running shoe 
which said to us that she had been jogging and whatever she had been wearing on the lower body was removed. There was virtually very little remains of blood on the ground and the body in our estimation had not been there long with the reason for my saying that saying that being the lack of decay. The expression on her face seemed to be that of horror, which had been frozen in time upon her death. She was wearing a tight lycra type of shirt underneath which we could see what I would say was a sports bra. The chest was completely collapsed and we could see what must have been segments of broken ribs protruding up through the shirt with blood stains surrounding them. The amount of trauma and physical damage that this corpse had been put through was self-evident, even to our untrained eyes. It was then that Jerry said to me, there ain't no way, no how, that we are coming back here to hunt. This place is cursed. I don't even want to be standing here anymore. I couldn't have agreed with him more as a kind of eerie chill began to consume my very being. It was then that Jerry said what I was already thinking. No dude did this to her. This was the result of a violent Sasquatch attack. There's no way a man could have or would have hung her up there like that, like it was a trophy being displayed. There was no evidence of any insects on the body not a single scratch or claw mark on the remaining flesh or garments. Obviously, after having made our way out, we reported our findings. And that was the end of it. Jerry and I had both passed on the hunting season that year, with the trauma of what we had both seen being too great for either one of us to deal with. I tried hunting the following year, but I was so uptight during the whole day, wondering what exactly may be wandering around or watching me, that I have since given up hunting entirely. The anxiety of that day's events still haunts me to this very day. Wow. There you have it. Coming around something like that out in the middle of the woods, uh, that sounds like something out of a horror movie, you know, like the Blair Witch Project or something like that. I mean, I can't imagine coming across a scene like that in general, uh, and then on top of it, doing the process of elimination and coming to the conclusion that this had to be a Sasquatch. Uh, truly terrifying. Yeah, well, he said that the limb was at eye level. Now, I'm just shy of six foot, and something at eye level is a pretty good heft off of the ground. And then if you consider that his description was that of like a dead stump of a branch going upward off of this horizontal branch that was at eye level. So something had to heft the victim up in the air and then forcibly put it down over the branch like you were hanging a sausage on a skewer. And just the strength of, and, and the, the why. What is with that? Why would that happen? You know, and then in the middle of the nowhere, in the middle of nowhere, like these guys were nowhere where really anybody else would be. So, you know, the whole idea, you know, it, it reminds me a lot like the, uh, you know, uh, 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 people saying they found uh, the, the, the tr not, not a tree stand, but the tree markers, you know, these uh, groupings of trees and bunches of trees and snapping off the tops of trees and, and different things going on that they believe are markers or indicators. This thing may, may very well have been like some type of warning. Or maybe it was a trophy. You know, I, I don't know. We'll never know. It's just a right. total... A total, total creep out. Oh, 100%. 100% creepy. Uh, and <laughs> the fact that it had the strength to skewer somebody, like, that's not easy. I I'm sorry. Like, I've never done it, but it cannot be easy to skewer somebody on a natural thing like a tree branch. 
Like it doesn't, that doesn't compute to me as somebody that is out there, some kind of like serial killer doing something like that. Like that takes a lot of strength. Well, I would imagine so. And just to have to, I mean, I go to the gym and work out, you know, 150 pounds is 150 pounds. A hundred pounds is just that a hundred pounds. You don't just grab stuff and fling it up over your head and, you know, manipulate it around. I mean, if you're lifting weight, you, you assume the posture, you get prepared and you, you make the lift, you know, you're not just freaking grabbing stuff or winging it around this way and that way and manipulating it when it's over your head. You know, but if you were freaking 12 feet tall and you were grabbing, picking something up that was just like waist height, you know, or a little higher and then, you know, working with it, that would be a different story. Yeah. And and he had said there was nothing to stand on. The area, there was no like a boulder pile under this branch or another down tree you could climb up on and g- gain some elevation. There was nothing there. So. That's that's uh that is like uh way out there on the fringe of bizarre, you know, like it, I don't even know what to say about that. And again, no evidence, no foot no footprints visible, nothing spoken about, no hair, no photographs, you know, this, that, and the other thing, you know. So I don't I don't know what to say about that, you know, but you just put it out there and you say, what do you think about this, you know? Yeah, and you let people draw their own conclusions and stuff. I mean, it, it's a it's a shame. It's a sad story uh, to just draw the conclusion as to how this person lived uh, the last moments of their life. But uh, it's one of those things where, again, I think it's very important for us to hear these kinds of stories, to be fully aware and acknowledge the dangers of these creatures. Yeah, well, I'm not one who thinks they're, uh, and I've said this many times, and I'll keep saying it. I think if you have a close encounter with a creature like this and you walked away, you had a really good day. Because I would, I would not venture to second guess that in a heartbeat, one of these things could, at the very least, bust you up or perhaps... Uh, take a drumstick off of you for dinner because uh, you know how people come off with, Oh, they're really nice creatures. Uh, How could you say that about them? Uh, You know, I don't know. According to what many of these people are saying, you know, do really nice creatures roar at you and show their teeth? You know, do really nice creatures throw hurl stuff at people and scare them to death. You know, I don't know. You know, it's a matter of conjecture, you know, but yeah. uh, it's not the way I'm looking at a really nice creature, you know? Well, what you just described, you described my 13-month-old son. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty terrifying <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Stop hurling things yeah. at me, son. Stop it, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I, I'll tell you, it's it's one of those things. I You got to make light of some of these situations and stuff, and... uh I, everybody knows that listens to my show. Sometimes I like clowning around. So, <laughs> yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, it's, it's good. You know, uh, laughter does the heart good. Absolutely. So you want to hear something strange? You say? Oh, give me something strange. Okay, now this is this is on the fringe of fantastic. Uh. The name of the story is the Dead Falls Lake Affair. And, uh, excuse me, coming into this tale, I'm going to warn you that this may be the freakiest sighting uh, that I have ever heard. And I'll ask you and the listeners to basically follow along as Marion Lane and her brother Chris Uh, weave this amazing story. In July of 1984, a group of about 20 people and the two of us had planned to head into the Shasta National Forest and hike up to Dead Falls Lake for a little overnighter with guitars and beers. 
if you've never been there, Mount Eddy Lake and Dead Falls Lake sit in what I would call a bowl surrounded by mountain peaks. There isn't much of a shoreline to speak of. Instead, the surrounding hills and trees abruptly meet the edge of the water. It is a fantastic and desolate spot, and it's a great destination for those who want to hike in and crash on a blanket once you can't stay awake any longer. We began the night's festivities, and it was turning out to be a pretty good night. We had some campfire sing-alongs, some hot dogs, and quite a lot of beer. We first noticed the blue light at about 2 a.m. This light was emanating from thousands of feet up, glowing over one of the northern peaks. Considering that there isn't anything out there in this hour of the night, aside from people like us, it was a bizarre sight. Needless to say, it had all of our attention. Some of us sat, others stood as we watched the blue light grow in intensity. It seemed as though the unknown source of the light was about to come over the peak. About 10 minutes later, there it was. It was miles away, but we could now make out a large glowing disk exuding what appeared to be a combination of extremely bright blue and white light. From a distance, it almost appeared like the disk was alive. I know this is really weird, but you'll know why I mention it in a minute. If it hadn't had our attention before, it certainly had our attention now. It slowly made its way over the peak and was gradually making its way down into the valley in which we were gathered. As it began its descent, beams of light started to emanate from different sides of the object. They moved from one side to the other, flashing on and off as it appeared to be scouring the terrain. Some members of the group were already getting antsy and afraid, especially the girls, but there was nowhere to run and hide especially since the searchlights were so bright. It was getting closer and closer to our position. We realized that whatever it was could certainly see our blazing fire, so some of us started to throw dirt on the flames and squirting them with beer. Others filled empty bottles with water from the lake in order to extinguish it. It was difficult to gauge the distance and the size of this object, but it was slowly coming towards the lake and the entire landscape was glowing beneath it. All of us could now see that the craft was organic. Now it was glowing with a yellowish white color, but bright blue still swirled around its base, which appeared like pigment being mixed into a can of fresh paint. It was beyond my wildest imagination. Another 10 minutes passed when half of the group said that they were getting the heck out of there, and the rest of us stayed. In the movies, the people who run always get attacked, and I wasn't planning to be one of them. The craft had now reached the other end of the lake, which was still a considerable distance away from us. By this time, I could now see that this disc was at least 200 feet across when all of a sudden it stopped and began to pulse, growing brighter and then dimmer like a heartbeat. All of the searchlights had stopped moving and a ring of fuzzy multicolored lights started to circle its outer edge. They were red, green, and yellow and they weren't sharp beams like the searchlights. Our fire was completely out now, and we were standing in the pitch dark, totally awed by what we were seeing, as the thing hovered over this one spot for over 20 minutes. Suddenly, a, wild co a wide column of powder blue light flashed from its base to the ground below, as the craft continued to pulse. 
from our vantage point, it was little more than a speck, but there was something being drawn up from the ground within the tube of light. This thing stopped about midway between the ground and the craft, literally suspended in midair within the light. Everything stayed still for another 10 or 15 minutes. But then several other specks started to descend from the craft's base. These specks were smaller than the first. Again, from the distance we were, there was no t way of telling what these things were. The descending specks stopped in the middle of the tube right where the first one was. After another half an hour of stillness, the specks that had descended from the craft were drawn back upward and vanished from our sight. However, the other one remains suspended in the middle of the tube of light. Suddenly, the craft stopped pulsing and began to glow brightly again, illuminating the entire lake area and the country, countryside below. And then it started to move. It glided slowly and silently over the lake, heading directly for us. Not a word was spoken among those who remained. We were awestruck and silent, staring in utter amazement. It was only a football field away and coming closer. And I could now see that this was a glowing structure. It was definitely a large disc but it had to be 400 feet wide, not the 200 feet that I had originally thought. It was enormous. The shaft of blue light remained totally intact and unmoving as the ship itself moved over the lake. The water started to grow choppy, just like it would on a windy day. However, it was only choppy within the confines of where the light contacted the lake's surface. Everything around the perimeter was still calm. The light was drawing on and or disturbing the water as it passed over it. Now I could see beyond the shadow of a doubt that the speck that had been lifted up from the earth and into the tube of light was a gigantic Bigfoot. It looked like it was in a state of suspended animation being held in the light some 75 feet off the lake surface. It didn't move an inch and was completely aglow in the soft blue light. The saucer passed just to our east and we all turned like automatons, watching it move away. Suddenly, there was a bright flash of light and it was all over. The disk was totally and completely gone. It had not flown away at a high rate of speed. It had vanished. We all stood in a daze for a few moments, almost as if we had been taken over by some type of mystic force while these events had unfolded. Seeing the Bigfoot motionless within the tube of light was unbelievable and what the connection was between it and the craft is still unknown to all of us. We simply saw what we saw. To stand in the open country and watch this silent, massive, glowing disc move across the landscape was intimidating. I mean, we all know jets, prop planes, ultralights, and rockets, but to behold something 400 feet in diameter moving at a snail's pace and hovering motionless, while not so much as making a sound was mind-blowing. It had to have run on some sort of inexhaustible energy source. The lights were so bright and they never stopped pulsing and glowing. I mean, think about it. When we fly on a jetliner, there are the cabin lights and a few lights on the fuselage of the jet. This entire craft was a light, and it contained numerous other tremendously powerful lights within it as well. The entire skin of this thing was moving, or at least that's the way it appeared to our eyes. 
it was like liquid contained within some type of casing, moving plasma, shifting and melting and swirling together. Well, what do you make of that? Just out of this world. You know, I have an opinion, and I've said it many times, that to me there is a natural and a supernatural aspect to the Bigfoot phenomena. Uh, personally, my belief is that the UFO phenomena is of demonic origins. Uh, I don't think these people are, these are creatures coming from another uh, planet. Uh, I don't have time to really voice all of the things regarding that. Sure. But I, I think that actual aliens, abductions, uh, I think you have things going on here where you have a creation, the actual Bigfoot creature, uh, because let's face it, uh, a ghost or something that's mimicked or something that's not real, does not smell, does not leave footprints, does not growl, does not roar, does not have decayed teeth in his mouth, uh, uh, does not eat, you know, does not kill animals to eat. Uh, and yet we have these other things. Now, look. Were these, was this spacecraft, was this craft looking to retrieve this Bigfoot? Was this a, a created, let's just say it was like a robot to mimic the real thing. Were they in the process of looking around with these spotlights, deliberately looking for this and having found it, hovered over it, put the beam on it, and drew, drew it up? And then what about these other specks coming down to it as a distance? At a distance, it was almost like something else came down to do some work on it or do something with it. And having spent some time by it for, I think he said, about a half an hour, then they withdrew. But of course, you know, you're talking a huge distance. They, uh, they were referring to the giant Bigfoot as a speck. So what were these smaller specks? Yeah, I just, I, I really don't know what to say about it, you know? Yeah. No, I, I've i heard people talk about these kind of things. I mean, it, it's it's very odd. It's very unusual. And it's funny, I just did a live show yesterday on YouTube, and one of the questions asked to me was this very thing. What do you make of the Bigfoot alien connection? And I said, I don't know. Because <laughs> I really don't know. I I hear these stories, and uh, Stan Gordon has documented stories like this, and uh, you hear people coming out that are you know whistleblower types talking about how they have inside knowledge of these quote unquote extraterrestrials that look like Chewbacca. Well, the Chewbacca looks like a Bigfoot, you know. So uh, I, yeah, I, I just I don't know what to make of it other than just to say, huh. You know, because yeah, it's just it's so far out on the fringe. But it's it's uh, something that it, it's becoming more and more common where people are talking about these kind of things that eventually, you know, people have to talk about it. And I don't mind talking about it. I just don't know what to make of it. Yeah, you know, I had another guy and his brother. Uh, this guy was very well to do. I think he was in Wyoming or Idaho. Uh, in one of my books, I'm not even sure what I named, named the account. You know, people think I have uh, instant mem memory for everything I've written yeah. down, and I don't. I don't. I have to physically, once I look at the title and, and read the first couple of lines, I'll say, oh, yeah, this was the account Tony Merkel sent to me. You know, it's, it's that way. But if you just said to me, like, Bill, uh, I'd like to hear the Grizzly encounter tonight, I'd be like, uh, really, I don't, I don't know it until I look at it, and then I say, oh, yeah. Well, anyways, this fellow in uh, Wyoming or Idaho, I think he was a software designer. He had done pretty well for himself. He was, you know, he was, he was uh, living large. And he had basically a farm for his own enjoyment. I'm talking animals, almost like a big petting zoo. Uh, nothing got eaten. They weren't milking the cows, nothing, just. He fed them, and they lived there. And Well, he started to have some animals get killed. 
And uh, they were found uh, laying out in the various pen, pens or fenced-in areas, uh, like with a big bite taken out of them, and they were dead. So he had told his brother about it. His brother had come over. They looked at it like, wow, that's freaking, you know, weird. And then they actually called over a local uh, veterinarian. And uh, she had come over to look at the the victim. And she said, wow, you know, I never saw anything like it. You know, possibly a mountain lion, a bear, you know, whatever. But she was guessing, too. Well, anyways... It happened again, and I think it happened two or three times. But on the one time, there was some snow on the ground that had fallen, and they saw a large set of tracks coming to the animal or in the area of the animal and then around it and then going away. So they followed the tracks out. Well, guess what? These big tracks began and ended in the same spot where there was a large swirling impression of some type of disc-shaped object having been in the snow. They didn't go beyond, and they didn't go through it. It was like it came out of the circular impression and went back to the circular impression. There were no tracks on the other side of the circular impression around it. It didn't circumvent it. It was like it came from it and went back to it. What's going on with that? Good luck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was just going to say, who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, but, you know, you know, I uh, I told Wes a while ago, uh, that in my own lifetime, I had had numerous angelic encounters. And when I talk to people about these things, I'm always trying to elicit a response from them. I want to hear what you have to say. And many times when I'm talking to people about Bigfoot, angels, UFOs, uh, they become comfortable and then they start to talk to me. Up until that point, uh, I guess it's just human nature, particularly in the society we live in here, that people don't talk about these things. They don't want to be perceived as being off the wall. And uh, I gave the example a couple of times of my neighbor. Uh, he was a retired police officer. He lived next door to me for about a decade before him and his wife had a horrible divorce and he got kicked out of the house. And I used to talk to him all the time. And, uh, in retirement, and I guess while he was still working on the job, he used to do lawn sprinklers. And so I had his number, and I called him up. This was just last spring. I called him up after we had a horrible winter over here. It was cold. There was snow. And, and it broke five heads in my sprinkler system. And uh, after he was done repairing the heads, I was sitting on the porch with him. And, like, you know, we were BSing, and he said, so what have you been up to? I said, I'm I'm in the middle of writing a bunch of books on Bigfoot. Well, I just finished telling him that, and he said to me, I got something weird to tell you. (laughs) all All I did was open the door by saying I'm writing books on Bigfoot, and that was enough of an, uh, an entrance for him to just come clean. <laughs> like, yeah. finally, I got somebody I can talk to, you know? Absolutely. So he goes on to tell me that while he was on duty, just north of where I live, him and a rookie were in the squad car, and they had just finished doing a paperwork handoff and or report to a sergeant. You know how cops park window to window? Yeah. I always wondered, like, you know, why did they do that? Are they just BSing or are they making a plan for the night? Like, I'm going to be over here if you need me or whatever. But he said they were actually giving a report, and he was giving some paperwork to the sergeant to take back to the station. They're sitting in the car. Now, the area he's talking about 
is extremely densely populated. There were tons of buildings there, and they were at a railroad station. The rookie says to him, hey, check that out. And Tom looks over there, and he says, that looks like a wire arcing on the pole. So the rookie says to him, are you sure? <laughs> so they finish handing off the paperwork. Tom starts to drive towards what he thinks is an arcing wire, and the thing starts to take off. Jeez. They're now chasing a ball of light up the street in front of a major hospital in pursuit of this thing in a squad car. And Tom said to me, they looked up and this thing took off. He described it like the old TV sets. When you used to turn it off, the light would just fade into like infinity. It would just be like a dot that just went gone. He said, that's exactly what this thing did as we sat there underneath it in the car looking at it. So, you know, I have no reason to believe that Tom was full of hot air. This is what he saw, and that's the end of it. Whatever you make of it is another story entirely. But to assume that this guy was and his partner uh, were hallucinating while on duty, it's, it's just more preposterous than him telling the story. Yeah. I mean, it, they'd have to be hallucinating the same exact thing. And that's one of the things that when I talk to people, and I, I just talked to somebody earlier today, and he was telling me these different experiences he's had, and most of them happened with other people. And I was telling him, it's got to be at least comforting in the sense that you don't got to worry about, am I crazy? Because you've experienced these things with other people. So it's not like you're, you're seeing things or you're going crazy. Like This is something that really happened. Yeah, well, look at this Dead Falls Lake affair. Over 20 people as it begins. Over 20 people. Yeah. I mean, I don't drink a lot of beer, but let me tell you something. I couldn't drink enough beer to make me imagine a 400-foot blue swirling <laughs> spacecraft coming over the countryside and a Bigfoot suspended yes. in a tube. You know, I don't know about you, but I drink good German beer, and even the Germans can't create a beer that'll do that. Right. Absolutely. So, <laughs> I just, you know, some of the some of the comments people make uh, to me uh, are more uh, more preposterous than anything that uh, I put to paper in these reports, and they think they're being serious. You know, it's a, it's an intelligence re- uh, t- intelligent response. Uh, uh, to rebut what it is I'm putting out there, which is accounts of people regarding Bigfoot. Oh, come on. You don't believe that. Uh, uh. And the fact remains that everybody says, where are the pictures? Well, where are the pictures? A lot of pictures have been taken and shared. The old ones were too fuzzy and shaky. Why can't they get a good one? Then when you present a good one, they're like, it's too perfect. It's CG. And then, of course, the Patterson Gimlin film. Oh yeah, sure. A couple of cowboys just happen to have an uh, eight millimeter movie projector in their saddlebag. You know, there is no pleasing those Absolutely. who just do not want to believe. Yes. Yeah. See, and that's the thing. Uh, we live in a time where technology now is. You know, people will say, "Well, we have all this technology. Why can't you get this, that, and the other?" And it's like. We have all this technology, and now that we, even if we did, you'd say it's fake because it's too easy to fake now. And so it's, it looks too real. Like Just like you said, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Bill, on that. It, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Now, I have a, a bit of a medical background. I mean, I've sat through anatomy, physiology, myology, kinesiology, pathology, neurology. I mean, I've had my fill of all ologies. I understand human movement, muscle, bony anatomy. When I look at the Gimlin film, Patterson Gimlin film, I am seeing something that is anatomically correct in its movements. And when I see the thigh flex to drag the leg forward, 
I'm seeing extension of the gastrocnemius in the back of the lower leg. I'm seeing the quads pump up with the skin still attached to them as the thing takes its steps. It's exactly the way it should be as a living creature. This thing was filling the suit. And I'm saying the suit. This thing was filling the skin as a living creature would fill the skin. It was correct. The arm swing, the shoulders, the biceps. You couldn't have... Somebody said this to me the other day. Bill, have you considered the Planet of the Apes film? That film was made with state-of-the-art makeup and technology at the time to make all of these ape creatures up for the movie. And there's no question about it when you look at them. They did a great job, but they all look fake. They did a great job, but at their best, they were fake. We knew right. it. We were going to see a sci-fi movie, and we were digging on the fact that, okay, they got the ape guys, the old spaceship crashed down by the water, these people left on the ape planet, whatever. I don't even remember the story. But at best, they still looked fake. To me, that Patterson-Gimlin film is a classic, classic piece. And I don't care who says what about this and that. That thing is the real deal to me. I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely couldn't agree with you more. And hearing it from you, somebody who does have a medical background, uh, it's, you know, it's reassuring. It's reassuring that, you know, it looks real to me. Uh, it looks real to you. And it doesn't matter if you think it's real or if I think it's real. There's always going to be somebody out there that wants to say it's fake. And that's fine, too. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. You know what I mean? Yeah, just go with it. I have, you know, I do not waste my time uh, talking to people about Bigfoot or anything else, for that matter, with people that are disinterested. I mean, I don't have to be in love with everybody on this planet or be everybody's friend all the time. And it's the same way in this Bigfoot community. Uh, it's the same way in, in, in many other things in life. You know, some people just don't like the way you look, Tony. And they don't like the things you say on your podcast. Right. You know, and it's the same thing with me. Who does this guy think he is? I read some of the comments, you know, on Amazon or something. Uh, you know, this guy. One guy, with all of the excellent encounters in here, one guy writes that he felt like he got ripped off by in the second volume because it was only half as long as the first volume. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I was there. I wish I was there to talk to him. I tell him, here's your freaking $13 back. Don't buy any more, please. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I just, man. I was in the CVS the other day and they wanted like $13 for a magazine on Frankenstein. <laughs> and I said, you know, please, with everything you just read in here, you're complaining about the price. Yeah. You know, and uh, but you can't make this stuff up, you know? Yeah, I, 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 I understand where you're coming from. As a content creator, I definitely get my share of emails of people uh, being angry at me for saying something on my show or not saying something on my show or everything in between. It's it's yeah. it's part of the gig. It's part of the gig when you're creating stuff. Because this is the way I view it, Bill. And I know we're kind of off topic, but it's okay. Uh, the way I view it is this. I create content. And there are people out there, hundreds of thousands of people that consume my content and they are the customer, essentially. And as a customer, they're entitled to their opinion on the product that I produced. Uh, the thing that I don't put up with is the nastiness and the way you approach me. If you approach me, if you have a, cri a cri uh, something to critique on what I'm doing, that's fine. But if you approach me in a disrespectful manner, anything that you have to say to me, whether it's good or bad, I'm not going to hear and I'm going to throw it right out the window because the way you approached me, I, I don't, mm -hmm. I have no time for people being disrespectful to me when I put so much time and effort, just like you do with your books. Uh, That's right. I have no time for that. 
dealing with somebody who just wants to be disrespectful. If you approach yep. me in a respectful yep. way and say, hey, I love the show. I think what you're doing here could be done a little bit better or whatever. We yep. can talk. We can talk. Yep. There's no doubt about it. You know, I also want to mention to you, uh, I set up a little page uh, for people to go with uh, or go to. Uh, it's uh, www.buybigfootbooks.com. Uh, there's a little link there taking you right to where you want to go if you want to look at them in ebook or paperback. Uh, and I don't know, I may try to develop something out of that going down the road. So I'm trying to direct people over to that, that page, you know? Absolutely. I was going to ask you where people could buy your books and stuff. So it's by Bigfoot, by Bigfootbooks.com, right? Right. Yeah. www. I don't even know if that matters. I mean, it just shows you where I'm at yeah. as, uh, as far as computer literacy goes. I, I think it mattered <laughs> in like 1999. So okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm a little behind it's the okay. curve, Tony. It's okay. I just checked it out now. <laughs> buy buybigfootbooks.com. It works great. Buybigfootbooks.com. Yeah. Hey Tony, I still have a uh, I'm still using an LG flip phone, so <laughs> I got you. I always tell people if I ever wind up not podcasting anymore i'm taking myself off social media and i'm going back to the flip phone i don't want to be on any smartphones nothing <laughs> i deal. i deal with conspiracy theories with the show sometimes i know too much <clears throat> i know way too much i don't want any part of the technology anymore but i have to be now yeah well you're you're in over your head or up to your head absolutely uh, oh wow well bill i'll tell you what i'm starting to lose my voice right now so i I think this would be a good time to say thank you for being on the show today. And uh, I really look forward to having you back on sometime and doing this again, because it was an absolute pleasure. Yeah. And the pleasure is mine. I mean, I told you, I love doing this stuff, you know, and I, I love the conversation. And in spite of, uh, uh, there's so many people have positive things to say that the negativity, I just let it slide off my back, you know? Absolutely. Uh, but it's been a joy, man. And, you know, you knock on my door anytime and I'll answer it. Sounds good, brother. Well, thank you for being here. Thanks a lot, Tony. Take care now. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.